I have spent much of my adult life living in southern states. As much as we like to think that American culture is the same everywhere, there are still some things that are different in the South than they are other places in the United States. And one of the ones that comes to mind, particularly given where I was working and what I was doing, was the fact that it was not unusual for someone in a casual conversation when they didn't really even know you very well yet to ask, where do you go to church? And I worked in a hospital where there were people coming from other states and other countries even, uh, and they found this very strange because in many parts of the world, that's a fairly private thing that you wouldn't ask about. Uh, you can talk about all sorts of other things, but you don't ask about people's religious faith in part because it's considered to be none of your business, but in part because in some places in the world, it's a little bit dangerous even to ask that question. Uh, whether you go to church, what church you go to, what religion you practice, what brand of that religion you practice can have a, an effect on your personal safety. And so it can be wise to make sure you know who you're talking to before you disclose that kind of information. Now, you could understand why someone who had come from uh, a country where there was unrest around religion might have been reluctant to answer. I wonder, though, for those of us who aren't as concerned or need not be as concerned about our personal safety, whether there are also some other reasons why we might not be all that enthusiastic about answering that question. I'll speak only for myself in this, but when anyone tells me what denomination of the Christian faith they belong to or what religion they practice, there's a Rolodex in my head that goes off, and I, I have a list of things that I think that person believes. All you have to do is tell me that you go to such and such a church, and I think I know what you believe. The well, same is true for us, dear friends, when we say where we go. People have an idea of what it is they think that we believe. The question is, do we? Are we willing to, to admit and confess to those things that are supposed to be the things that we believe? Are we willing to take them out into the street, out of this place, and actually practice them? The disciples find themselves in a situation like that this morning. They are locked up again, high, hidden away, and Jesus comes and stands among them. They've been following him for a while, but for most of that time, there really wasn't an enormous cost to it. They might have lost their source of livelihood, or they might have lost a few of their friends. Their families might not have understood why they were following this itinerant preacher. But now with Jesus, after Easter, risen from the dead, standing among them, they're confronted by the need to decide what it is that they believe, to decide where it is they're going to say that they go to church, if you want to put it that way. And the same thing falls to us now after Easter. Jesus comes and stands among us. We have to decide what it is that we believe, what it is that we believe deeply enough, strongly enough, that we will actually pattern our lives on it and confess it in the street whenever we're asked. That can be hard because we go through our lives not necessarily knowing what situations we're going to find ourselves in, not knowing which piece of what it is that we say we believe we're going to need to pull out. So it is worth it occasionally, I think, to ask, what is it that we believe? What is it that is firmly placed enough in our faith that it will guide us in the choices that we make? This is something that's difficult in, in Christianity. It's a part of the, the liberal conservative debate that goes on in the church. The liberal church says of the conservatives that all they care about is what they believe and they don't actually do anything about it. The conservatives say that all the liberals care about is doing stuff about it. They don't really care what it is they believe. There's probably some truth on each side. But if we're going to be honest Christians, surely we must say what it is that we will stand on. There are a few hints this morning in the gospel lesson about what some things are that we might chew on as being pieces of that, I think. The first is the very clear idea that comes up right at the beginning that one way or another, God will always find a way in. Bidden or unbidden, God is present. Sometimes we try to hide away as well, just as the disciples were doing. And yet God somehow finds a way into whatever situation may be going on in our lives, whatever the joy or the sorrow, the frustration, the anxiety, the anger, nothing will keep God out. 
And that isn't just true for all of us gathered here together as a community. It's true in each one of our individual lives as well. Wherever we are, whatever is going on with us, God is present in that situation also if we are faithful followers of Jesus. That makes us God-bearers. You think of yourself as a God-bearer? Do you ever think about what it means when you go into the situations you find yourself in day to day to imagine that you are bringing the presence of God with you and indeed are finding the presence of God there already because there is nowhere we can go, no height, no depth, where we will not find that God has preceded us. I have a small advantage over many of you in this, in that under this costume that I'm wearing, I have on another costume which clearly identifies me as to what I do for a living. Yesterday after the funeral, I went over, walked across the UD campus to get lunch quickly before the next thing started. And I guess this was a weekend when admitted students and their parents come to check out the University of Delaware because there were scads and scads of people everywhere. And this is one of those occasions where it's really interesting to be me and to be dressed the way I was dressed yesterday to see what reaction I got from all the people that I passed. Because everybody notices the collar and then you can see what they're going to do next. Some people are very quick to look away, not to make eye contact because if they do, who knows what might happen next. <laughs> next question might be, when's the last time you went to church? Other people are plainly pleased to see me there thinking, well, maybe if my kid goes here, he or she will find his or her way into church once in a while because there's someone in that costume walking around the campus. Other people plainly don't know what to make of it. They're, they're, they're confused. They, they don't even recognize what's going on and they just keep on going. Whatever happens, I have brought God into those interactions and so I can't respond in just any way. I can't look distracted. I have to look as if I'm willing to engage. More than once, I have been in the grocery store dressed like this, not literally, you know, uh, and someone has stopped me and wanted to talk, something they needed praying for, particularly a loved one usually who's sick or in trouble. Uh, I can't say, I'm sorry, I'm too busy. I don't know who you are. You're not one of my flock, not my problem. Each one of us is in that same position. If we bring the presence of God into every interaction in our lives, we're bringing the mercy and grace and compassion and love of God into every one of those interactions also. And we have no choice but to show them, to act on them. I can't tell you how much difference being dressed the way I'm dressed under this has made in the way that I drive. I have come to understand that I can no longer say the things to other drivers that I would once have said <laughs> when they can look over and see me dressed like this. I wonder what reminder you might need to carry through your days like that is for me. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, you are a God-bearer. Is that something you think you can stand on? Is that something that you think you can carry out of this place and live in your life this week? That is worth wrestling with today and tomorrow and every day that comes after. The next thing is Jesus says, peace be with you. There's a hymn in the hymnal that I like to quote uh, that begins, the peace of God, it is no peace. It talks about some of the followers of Jesus and the travails that they had, the sticky ends they came to, everything that happened in their lives as a result of being faithful in following Jesus making the point that the peace of God is not the peace of they're there, it's all going to be okay. All you have to do is sit and smile and everything will take care of itself. It's the peace of strength. It's the peace of they're there. Ultimately, everything will be okay, even if in the meantime, it is not okay. How much of the world is pretty peaceful because it feels like it has everything settled? Settled in the way that it exploits people, settled in the way that it abuses people. How much disruption does the peace of God cause when it comes into those situations? And yet how much need is there for the peace of God to come into such situations? We as followers of Jesus are cats among the pigeons. 
when it comes to disrupting the order of this world in order to bring more into fullness the peace that God intends for all of creation. I stop just for a second because the harder part of that, dear friends, is when it's not just those people out there, but it's these people in here. What parts of ourselves are awfully calm and settled because they are pretty carefully walled off from the peace of God? What parts of ourselves might be disrupted just a little if the peace of God ever got in there? That, dear friends, is what we are called to allow to happen first in ourselves and then to take out into the world because in addition to being God-bearers, we are peace-bearers. We are meant to be the ones who cause the chaos that precedes all that God desires for the world. Is that something you think you can take out of here and do in your life? Then Jesus opens their minds to the scriptures. Now it's clear enough what he's doing in that moment. He's explaining to them why everything that happened in Holy Week and Easter had to happen why it was that the prophets predicted that this is the way the Messiah would be treated and the way God would respond, God's ultimate victory over the world's attempt to silence God's Messiah. And that's important. But there's a deeper message there, I think. And that is to say that God never, ever will desert us. However many times we fall away, however many times... We, we run away after false gods. How many, however many times we break covenants, however many prophets we kill, God will not give up on us. The world looks at the church and sees a dying institution. And in some ways it is. There are fewer people in the pews now than there would have been 50 years ago. In some ways the church has lost some public influence. The problem with that is that the world confuses the institution of the church with the mission of the church. I see absolutely no reduction in the mission of the church because the mission of the church is the mission of God. And God has not given up on humanity. God still desires the healing and health and joy and salvation for all of creation that God has always intended. Those have not gone away and to whatever imperfect extent the church can participate in those things, its mission continues just as much as it ever did. Can you imagine that being what you take out of here this week? To understand yourself to be part of the mission of God. That the compassion and love and mercy that you bring into the world is part of what it is God desires to happen. And that in some way, by doing even those little things, we become part of what it is God intends for the healing of the universe. Could you do that? Is it too tall an order? Is it possible even to imagine how that might happen in your life and my life, in our lives? and what the consequences of it might be. Did you hear the line in, in 1 John this morning? It says that those who have faith in Jesus purify themselves. I am well aware of how impure I am, and I am well aware of how little I can do to fix it. But if perhaps by my feeble attempts at faith, I might have a chance to achieve some of the purity that God desires for me and for everyone. Why would I not try? What have I got to lose, dear friends, when that is what God desires for you and for me and for all of us? And it's a good thing that I end up getting a little built up that way because the last part is still coming. Maybe you can see where the last part is going to go already. It's where it usually goes. Jesus tells his listeners that they are his witnesses in the world. This is where Episcopal palms usually start to get just a little sweaty. It starts to sound like evangelism. 
I hasten to tell an Episcopal audience that this is not about picking up your New Testament and standing on the street corner and haranguing people. In fact, it's much harder than that. In fact, what it is, is living your life in such a way that others cannot mistake why it is that you live the way that you do. That the joy and the peace and the love and the compassion, the forgiveness, the mercy, the grace that you bring to every encounter you have makes it impossible for anyone else not to know who you are and whose you are. Do you think you can do that? awfully difficult, dear friends, because it becomes fatiguing, or it seems to become fatiguing. That ultimately is where the grace of God has to keep strengthening us again and again and again to come back to this work, because we are the witnesses of Christ to all those we meet. We are the hands and the heart of Christ in the world. These are the things that I propose to you we should be standing on. These are the things that we should say loudly and proudly that we believe. Both here when we are together and out there in the world when we are singly encountering the presence of God wherever we go, bringing the peace of God to every person we meet. So, plenty to chew on this week. I won't ask for reports next week, but... That's where we begin. Christ is with us. Easter continues. We are called on to say what we believe and then to go live it. Amen.